How has this country, still rising from poverty, managed to build a global brand with influence moving in so many directions? In the mid-1980s, Ethiopia was the poorest country in the world. I'm talking the absolute bottom of the world rankings. The country was under the iron rule of a Marxist dictatorship that was very closely tied to the Soviet Union and was mired in a grinding war and suffering from a terrible famine. In short, Ethiopia was traumatized and exhausted. Ethiopia's once sparkling global reputation was in ruins. And after the Second World War, under the Emperor Haile Selassie, the country had had a pretty high profile. In fact, the emperor was really the most famous African of the century before South Africa's Nelson Mandela came along. The emperor just looked the part, regal embodiment of this ancient land, and yet with the modern side, he took Ethiopia into the League of Nations after the First World War to join the international movement to enforce the peace. But he became world famous with his defiance of the rise of fascism, which gave Ethiopia a base of soft power. Remember, Ethiopia was occupied by Italy under Mussolini for five years, starting in 1936. But famously, Ethiopia was never colonized by a European power like much of the rest of Africa. Fast forward to the 2020s and you'll find that Ethiopia wields influence in Africa and around the world in surprising ways, which we're going to talk about. I was going to say like my fellow YouTubians, smash the subscribe button, but that doesn't sound like soft power, so tap it please. Back in the early 1960s, the emperor campaigned hard for Ethiopia to become the diplomatic capital of Africa and he won. In 1963, the Organization of African Unity was formed. It lasted until 2002. I wouldn't say it was all that united that, through that entire period, but it was the forum for Africa, African nations to come together and discuss a lot of issues and also express those out to the wider world. Hmm. You know, sometimes I just wish I had the power to change things. As African youth, we have the power to create the Africa we want. We desire and demand an Africa that is peaceful and secure. You'll now find in Addis Ababa among the more than 100 embassies in that city, uh, an outpost for every country in Africa, because every country in Africa has got to be there to be represented at the AU. Even the United States, which has its own mission an ambassador just for the AU. The world must recognize Africa's extraordinary progress. Today, Africa is one of the fastest growing regions in the world. Africa is on the move. A new Africa is emerging. If you sense that something big is starting to happen in Africa and you want to know more, want to understand how to be a part of this and add value to this new era of Africa changing the world, then welcome to Edward in Africa. I've been here 10 years in Africa, almost half that time in Ethiopia, and earlier as an international editor for a global news organization. Back in the 1980s, the political scientist Joseph Nye came up with this concept of soft power. He said, you know, you've got hard power, which is military, economic, where you try to coerce other nations or other uh, actors. Then you've got soft power, Nye said, which is more like culture, persuasion, prestige, values, more magnetic sort of elements to pull people toward you in a very much more subtle way. As the emperor helped to usher in independent African nations freed from colonial rule, well, Ethiopia's reputation just shined all the more. Now, this was a little weird, a monarch embracing the rule of the people, but it worked, and America loved him for it. 
Soft power, it turns out, translates into influence elsewhere. Case in point, the head of the World Health Organization and the first African in that job is Ethiopia's former health minister and foreign minister. To me, one of the most impressive things that Ethiopia does every day is to put a $300 million Boeing or Airbus jet on the ground in another country. You can bet that catches people's attention. I've flown this airline around Africa, indeed around the world, and I've seen that trust, particularly among passengers from other African countries, that trust and pride, really, of here is a company, state-run Ethiopian Airlines, that is competing in a high-pressure business around the world and landing aircraft efficiently, loading them up on schedule for the most part, not always, but pretty uh, consistently, and moving them reliably and safely throughout the world. Tef, Shiro, Dorowat, I mean, in case you haven't noticed, the world is mad for Ethiopian food. And just type in the term, type in the term to the search engine here and see what you get. Videos with millions upon millions of views by celebrity chefs and by just food bloggers that are traveling around. Ethiopian food is taking the world by storm. I am a huge, I mean, big Tom big fan of Ethiopian coffee, the best of which comes from these wonderful cloud forests in southwestern Ethiopia. And of course, then there's the beautiful Ethiopian coffee ceremony. Enjoy that when you have the chance. Coffee is Ethiopia's number one export, but this is more than business. This is a cultural gift to the world. Think about it. Every morning, Ethiopia gets the day started for people from Seattle to Tokyo. Because of the terrible droughts of the 1980s, the world came to believe that Ethiopia was like a bone-dry desert. In fact, Ethiopia has nine major river systems and 22 lakes, including Lake Tana, which is massive and is the source of the Blue Nile, which feeds most of the water into the Nile River that passes Cairo. It's true that Ethiopia has areas of, of drought, especially in the lowlands, which get limited rainfall. But the water that's gushing down from the highlands thousands of feet into the lowlands creates immense potential for generating electricity. And that's exactly what Ethiopia has been doing. From the Nile River up in the north to the Omo River here, Ethiopia has built major dams to generate electricity and sell some of that power to neighboring countries. I once flew to Washington from Addis Ababa, and within five feet of getting off the plane, of exiting the door, I heard Amharic, the national language of Ethiopia, being spoken by an airport worker. In fact, there's so many airport workers at Dulles International Airport who are Ethiopian. It's like a little slice of Addis Ababa. Now comes the rise of the Ethiopian international celebrity, and first in the parade is the chef and food entrepreneur, Marcus Samuelson, raised in Sweden, now based in the United States with his businesses, and the wonderful writer Maza Mengiste, whose novel The Shadow King, set during the Italian-Ethiopian War, shortlisted for the Booker Prize. She fled with her family in 1974 after the coup in uh, Ethiopia from Addis Ababa and eventually ended up in the United States, raised there as a child. And the megastar from Canada, from the music world, Born Abel Tesfaye to Ethiopian immigrant parents, you know him as The Weeknd. So what are some ways you think Ethiopia is influencing the world? Drop a comment uh, below. Leave a like if you got some value out of this video. If you disagreed, leave a grumble. Thanks for coming along in this journey, exploring soft power.